from John O'Donohue. If you go out for several hours into a place that is wild, your mind begins to slow down, down, down. What is happening is that the clay of your body is retrieving its own sense of sisterhood with the clay of the landscape on which you walk. Lovely. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, that's what we were invited to do. We were invited to go out into the clay of the landscape mm -hmm. and, and be revived. And I hope you found that experience reviving. Um, in my research, I just found so many, so many things that um, uh, turns a phrase, really, that O'Donoghue uses um, that could help me go deeper into our topic for this week. Um, and though I'm going to talk about this one on our last day, it's actually one of the first ones I found, which is why I um, used his book as a resource. Um, and I hope that you're going to agree that it doesn't disappoint. He wrote this. We seldom notice how each day is a holy place where the Eucharist of the ordinary happens, mm. transforming our broken fragments into an eternal continuity that is able to keep us. Mm. We seldom notice how each day is a holy place where the Eucharist of the ordinary happens, transforming our broken fragments into an eternal <laughs> continuity that keeps us. I thought the phrase actually was a little startling, um, a Eucharist of the ordinary. Um, and I was intrigued because I think, first of all, it um, assumes a lot of uh, O'Donoghue's readers, assumes that they know what that is. Um, in the Protestant tradition, we don't use that word. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty uh, tradition specific. Um, and he uses it with a capital E which, you know, if you're reading something and something starts with a capital letter and you don't know what it is, you could just go Google it and <laughs> figure out what that is. Um, but um, most of us um, in our room know what he, he's uh, um, making reference to, what it means. But then he uses it to frame or clarify an appreciation of the beauty we find in the ordinariness of our days. What does that mean? To even begin, how do we even begin to understand that? Um, so, um, as I do with everything, when I don't understand something, I, you know, let's get down to the bottom. Let's let's go to the base elements and and try try it on and see see what we have. So, um, what is Eucharist at its most elemental? What is Eucharist at its most elemental? What is it? Yeah gift. Yep. We're going to go through a list of words because what he says um, is that this Eucharist of the ordinary happens um, and that it's holy. Mm -hmm. So Pat will go with yours. Um, he's saying that gifts happen every day that make where we are holy. Mm -hmm. Gifts happen every day where, that make where we are holy. Um, technically, it is a sacrament. So he was at least saying that each day sacraments happen that make where we are holy. Um, a little deeper into my memory, which <laughs> is hard work these days. Um, what is the sacrament? It's an outward sign of inward grace. Outward signs happen daily, which make where we are holy. Grace happens daily, which makes wherever we are holy. Um, and then we're using more words. Grace, what, what is grace? Unmerited favor happens daily. That makes where we are holy. Um, Eucharist is spiritual nourishment. 
each day spiritual nourishment happens for us that makes where we are holy. Outward signs, grace, nourishment, favor. He says it transforms our broken places into an eternal wholeness that is able to keep us. <coughs> it can go further. Eucharist is also mystery. Mystery happens mm -hmm. in the ordinariness of our day and makes where we are holy. Each day in ordinary ways, healing happens. Which could take us back to our first day, day when we heard from Dostoevsky um, that beauty saves us. That beauty saved me, Father Clement says. And John O'Donohue would concur he would say that beauty heals us. Beauty heals us in the Eucharist of the ordinary. I am an all too frequent visitor um, of the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Um, the short version is that I was diagnosed three years ago with um, a rare autoimmune disease I'll say it because no one will ever remember it. Granulomatosis with polyangiitis. My um, cardiologist, every time I go in says, what is it again that you have? <laughs> so this is what they told me when I was diagnosed. 17 million people a year are diagnosed with cancer. 26 million people a year are diagnosed with heart disease. But only 220,000 are diagnosed with granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Um, another note from my cardiologist, he said, I only ever saw that word on my exams. <laughs> um, so that's the reason I spend a lot of time at the Mayo Clinic. They do research. And, um, and to do that, they need my blood, actually. <laughs> um, it's not a contagious thing. Um, it's not a, a genetic thing. They have no idea what the origin is it is, of it is. It's also not curable, but it's treatable. Really only in the last 20 years is it's treatable. Um, but it's going on, so hence I spend a lot of time at Mayo Clinic. On my, our, I was gonna say my, our, Sam was with me on the first visit. I couldn't help but notice, um, when, even when we went into the intake area, which is massive, um, there was art on the wall um, not prints, not photographs, huge, massive, original artwork all over. We went up, you know, you go from that, and then they send you over here to do this, and we went to the next waiting room, and there was artwork all over. Went up to where I would meet with the doctor, <clears throat> there was more artwork all over. Um, you know, it was absolutely everywhere. Um, I came to know in the, you know, the couple of years since then, that when you walk down this like half mile hall that connects three buildings, there is, again, larger than life size artwork, um, reliefs, hanging sculpture. I'm like, this is a hospital. Sam had worked in a hospital. Sam was a hospital pharmacist for his whole career. I visited those hospitals. They did not look like this. <laughs> Makes you wonder. Makes you wonder. Um, outside the grounds look like an arboretum. Everything's trimmed, everything's perfect. There's little lakes, there's little fountains, there's wonderful sounds. It's like being here. It's a hospital. Um, now that I'm able to walk better, I used to drive up to the building, someone would take my car and I would just go in. Now that I'm able to walk, I park as far away as I can from the building I have to go to just so I can walk through the area. If I wouldn't have to drive to it, I'd walk my dogs there. <laughs> um, what is it about all this beauty in this place? Um, uh, a, a second part, not just art. Um, we were going in for our vaccines um, within the last couple of years. And um, so I don't know where you got your vaccine, but you know, with the, one of their bigger rooms, like an auditorium, and there's 
you know, 30 nurses with their little desks and people give you your number and you go sit down. Mm -hmm. In the middle of that room was a woman with a harp playing harp music while we were getting our vaccine. Who's that about? <clears throat> or from the mezzanine level, going someplace else in the building, a man in tails at a grand piano at 11 o'clock in the morning. What is all that about? Because that's been recent in the last 10 years. Yeah. They're building hospitals with all that in mind now. Yeah. <coughs> and, and, and there's a reason. Piero Ferrucci, he's an Italian um, psychotherapist. He says, beauty can heal our wounds. It lightens the weight of our worries. It guides us in our confusion and to some extent heals as it soothes our physical suffering. Ruchi is especially positive about studies around healing. That they were all done in Europe um, uh, about the power of beauty and healing. And he offered this. He writes, an English study seized the opportunity. A hospital needed to close and all the patients, doctors and nurses worked to be moved to a new facility. The new hospital was built according to all the criteria of pleasing architecture, maximization of space and light, ventilation, design, color, and protection <laughs> from noise. Furthermore, the rooms were offered in such a way as to give patients a choice of either strict privacy or communication with others, and everything was done to make the environment both functional and beautiful. The results were noteworthy. There was a 21% shorter recovery time a drastic reduction in the dispensing of painkillers and a greater daily satisfaction recorded from both patients and staff. Beauty heals, he says. The results were similar to another study described in the Science Journal following a group of patients who all had the same surgery. So there's a group of people who all had the same kind of surgery. The patients in the first group were in rooms that had windows that looked out on nature, looked out on trees and gardens. Patients in the second group had windows that faced parking lots and brick walls. <laughs> the first group had shorter stays. Same surgery, both of these groups. The, the uh, first group also, again, had less need for painkillers and reported fewer negative comments on discharge. Ferrucci concluded that healing is not a, just a physical fact. Healing is perhaps above all psychological and spiritual. He says healing is an organic process of our entire being. It is brought forth by forces quietly operating deep within us. And he concludes beauty is the perfect medicine. He says, rather than lowering um, our consciousness, as so many treatments or drugs do, sorry, Sam, <laughs> um, beauty lifts us above our problems. It has no ill side effects. Its benefits last. It creates no dependency, and no multinational company has yet succeeded to trademark it. <laughs> mm. To enjoy it, we don't even need a prescription. However we frame it, beauty has a potential for healing, not from the outside, um, but from the inside. As we allow it to permeate our deepest self um, through awareness, through observance, through our silence, through practice, um, beauty is the Eucharist of the ordinary. I've heard that we can be healed, but not cured. Healed, but not cured. Yeah. yeah. Because our suffering is in that which we need to heal from, whether or not we're cured. Yeah? Yeah. So I have a, a YouTube video. When you see the first 
two minutes of it, let me get to, let, just let you know that you're going to say, what in the world is she showing us? But the last three minutes is redeeming. And I, I thought about just showing you the last three minutes, but I thought, no, you yeah. need to know his, his background. Chris Jordan is um, an environmentalist, and he does documentaries around the world. And this is just a five-minute clip um, of, a, of a documentary. Um, he also has a YouTube video. He did a TED Talk, which is 20 minutes long. We didn't have time for that, so I'm going to just... Um, I just need to start it. I don't need to set it all, actually. Exaggerated <clears throat> because we think that's the right thing to do. The point of no return is fast approaching. I'm tired of the term catastrophe. Failure to act soon will lead to a steady stream of catastrophes. Disaster. Natural disasters surge dramatically over the past 20 years. And especially apocalypse. Australia's apocalyptic bushfire struck with a frightening ferocity in 2020. Climate change is not an apocalypse. It's a serious long-term problem that needs our deepest, wisest attention. Mm -hmm. I'm really tired of people advocating for panic. Billions of people are going to die. When we're in a state of fear, we know from neuroscience that our mind shuts down. There's never a time when panic is the appropriate response to any situation. If you wake up in the middle of the night and your house is on fire, panic is the worst possible response. The proper response is equanimity, full mind intelligence, backed by wisdom. That's what we need, not only if our house is burning down, but to face a global problem like climate change or any environmental issue. We've been stuck in a very energetically dark story about what's happening to our world for a long time. And it isn't working. It's time to change the story. Let's go immerse ourselves in the transformational healing power beauty who hasn't stood in the presence of beauty and had their heart break open with joy beauty and love go together they're identical twins find one of them and the other one will immediately show up every living being it's a plant or an animal at any scale is an incomprehensibly complex and magnificent artwork created by the universe. Every leaf, every branch is a magical, mysterious, spiraling math equation emerging out of nothing every detail of the living world speaks to us in the sacred language of beauty one of the fundamental characteristics of beauty is the more you look for it the more you see the more you cultivate beauty the more appears before you I'm going all in on beauty. I'm all in. Mm -hmm. Of all times, 
Why turn toward beauty right now? Because maybe the fact that we turned away from beauty is how we got ourselves into this mess in the first place. I'm not advocating living in denial of the problems. All I'm advocating is we need to change our relationship to each other about those problems. I think it's time for the whole world to let this dark storm of impending apocalypse move on through. Let us each connect with the ocean of love we all carry inside of us. Let us make beauty the North Star that we collectively set our compass to and navigate by. Let us together step into a new, beautiful, connected, loving story of our world and our future. May it be so. down his speech in case I um, couldn't pull up the video. <laughs> it sounds much better coming from him than it would have sounded coming from me. I was really surprised by um, this environmentalist, this naturalist's um, mystical appreciation of beauty. I was, I was surprised. Um, and also his bold prophetic language and conceptualization of nature um, as calling humankind to healing and wholeness and to love and to joy through beauty. <laughs> um, yeah. When I listen to him, I, I think um, the phrase I would use is, is he has an old soul. Mm -hmm. There's a depth there that When we get older, it doesn't necessarily mean we have an old soul. <laughs> there are children with old souls, and there are really old people that mm, not so much an old soul. <laughs> but he has an old soul. Um, so he reminds us of the dialectic we've been talking about. Um, um, if beauty heals, we have need for fewer words if beauty heals we don't need to panic there was just so much in that that i i really really appreciate it so this afternoon we're going to continue drawing together um some more pieces and kind of closing everything down it'll be our last uh, conversation but um i'm really glad the video worked and that that is what is going to lead us into our time of meditation